Money Pit is presented by DAP Spray Texture and Dice Coatings. Now here are Tom and Leslie. Coast to coast and floorboards to shingles, this is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. And we are here to help you take on the projects that you want to get done around the house. It is a beautiful fall day. I love this time of year because the weather is crisp. I am inspired to take on projects big and small. And if you've got a project on your to-do list, we would love to help. Reach out to us with your questions. All you need to do is go to moneypit.com slash ask and click the blue microphone button, or you can call us at one eight 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 money pit Coming up on today's episode, are you in the market for new furniture, but maybe don't have a big budget to handle it? Well, if so, upcycling might be perfect for you. We're going to have tips to help you get started, including how to make the best furniture choice for an upcycle. And as the days get shorter and darker, now's a great time to update your home's lighting. LEDs offer a long-term energy savings, but between understanding lumens, watts, color temperature, all of those bulbs are labeled with a whole lot of options, and it can be a bit confusing. So we want to help you get the best solution for your home just ahead. And carbon monoxide is an odorless gas that results from the combustion of fuels like natural gas or oil or kerosene or even charcoal. So we're going to give you some tips on how to make sure your heating system is not putting out that nasty stuff. But first, we want to help you create your best home ever. So whether you're doing the job yourself or you're hiring a pro, we are ready to help you get that job done right the first time. So give us a call. Let us know what you are working on this autumn weekend. We are so happy to lend a hand. We love to hear what you're working on. And you know what? Send us pictures, too. We love to see all of your hard work. So let us know how we can help. And you can connect with us by going to moneypit.com slash ask for the fastest possible response. Just click the blue microphone button. Let's get to it, Les. Who's first? Heading out to Texas, where Colleen has a question about water softening. What's going on? Well, we have uh, well water And it's really high in sodium and calcium, and it's extremely hard. Okay. And we've had water softeners before, Mm -hmm. and they need, some of them need to be replaced. Okay. And I was looking at this easy water that you recommend, and I was wondering if it would really take care of the extremely hard water we have in West Texas. Well, I've never um, had a listener use it with really, really, really hard water. It sounds to me that. If uh, that's the case here, you probably need a salt-based water conditioner, which, by the way, doesn't put salt in your water. It just fosters the chemical um, process that that, uh, softens the water and makes it easier to use. What Easy Water does is it charges the particles in the water so that they don't stick together and they don't clog your pipes and stuff. Uh, And then, um, But I do think it probably would still be feel a bit hard when you're trying to do your clothes. Like sometimes it doesn't feel like it gets sudsy when it's really hard. So I would just replace it with a standard salt-based uh, water conditioner, Colleen, okay? Would you suggest using that charger, too, on the, in the well, the pump house? So that doesn't go in the well. That goes at the, on the main water line when it comes in. It, it wouldn't hurt, but I would, I would put the, the, the uh, salt-based system on first because I think you'll find that's probably enough. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Good luck with that project. Thanks for calling us at 188 Pit. Those easy water systems are like, think of them as magnets, Leslie, where, you know, the particles are, have, have the same charge, so they repel each other. And, and they're, they're effective because they, it doesn't stick to the pipes and clog up things. Um, but I still wonder whether or not you'll get the same level of sort of like sudsiness. I know that if I've had houses with hard water that you try to wash your hands, for example, with soap or try to do the dishes, it doesn't get very slippery because the hard water just kind of fights it's you the so whole time. It's so weird, isn't it? It's a very weird feeling, and, and it kind of dries out your skin, too. Oh, I know. It's I've experienced it when traveling with the home makeover shows. You know, it's like you get to like Louisiana and you're almost always going to have it. And you're like, why is my hair always yeah, like this? What's, what's wrong with this? Right? What happened to my hair? <laughs> yeah, and it's so weird for the ice makers. Like the ice is never right. And like the dishwashers get clogged up. Like it's just not good all around. And if you have a tankless water heater, so it has a very, very small plumbing system where the pipe goes through many, many loops, it can clog them up. There's actually cleaning procedures in areas that have hard water for tankless systems uh, because they can clog up and stop working. Well, hopefully this helps her. Stan in Florida is on the line, and uh, it's apparently raining in his house. Stan, what's going on? Well, we like to keep it cool and comfortable, and with the humidity outside, the condensation accumulates on the air vents. 
Right. And it literally is dripping and uh, staining the ceiling areas where I've painted. Yep. I've seen this before, and it's amazing how much humidity and how much water can come out of the air when it's that warm, right? Yes, it is. It's uh, been bothering us. I was wondering what my solution might be. So your solution is to insulate the air conditioning ducts. You know, we don't think about insulating ducts much in the southern part of the country because usually you're insulating them to prevent heat loss. In this case, the reason that you're getting this condensation is because you have warm, moist air, of course, that's up in that attic space where those ducts are. And as that warm, moist air strikes the attic ducts, it condenses and releases its moisture, much the same as what you would see happen if you took a glass of ice water outside and outside the glass gets wet. That's the warm moisture in the air striking the glass and cooling. So as it cools, it releases water because cool air can hold less moisture than warm air. That's why no one ever complains about it being too humid when it's cold outside because the moisture is not in the air. So what you need to do is to insulate those ducts. Now, I can imagine that in some cases this is difficult because of getting access to it, but perhaps if you focused on the areas where it's worse, by insulating the ducts, you won't get that condensation that forms on them because the insulation will be a barrier then between the duct and the warm air itself. Does that make sense? It sure does. And that is the solution there, Serge. You've got to, got to have insulated ducts, and that will stop that from happening because we can't control the humidity, that's for sure. Right. Well, we have some blown-in insulation, but I was wondering, should I add an attic fan and circulate the air? Would that help any also? I don't generally recommend attic fans, and here's why. Especially in a southern climate, what attic fans tend to do is depressurize the attic as they try to pull air out of it. But the problem is they don't just stop at the attic. They are so strong that they reach in through through the wall cavities where wires and pipes go through and there's little spaces between the drywall and the walls and they actually find a way to steal the air conditioned air from your house. So using an attic fan in Florida can actually drive up your cooling costs when most people would think it's the opposite. If you want to improve the ventilation in the attic, you should do it passively by adding ridge vents to the peak and then making sure the soffits, the overhang, are fully open and you you know, you'd have screening there, but you want to make sure the air can get in there. And this way it goes in the soffits, it goes under the roof, and goes out the ridge. But a fan itself is not a good idea. That said, I can promise you that just improving the ventilation is going to stop the condensation. I think you're going to find when push comes to shove that insulation is the best solution to this issue. That sounds accurate to me. I appreciate your help so much, and that's what I'm going to do. You're very welcome, Stanley. Thank you so much for calling The Money Pit. Thank you. Bye-bye. This episode is brought to you by Pete's. Few things start your day better than a good coffee. That's why Pete's hand roast their coffee from a specific selection of high-quality beans. And they don't just put those beans into anyone's hands. Pete's trains their roasters for 10,000 hours so they can master the roast that gives you the most. Pete's Coffee. Coffee for coffee people. Find Pete's online or at your local retailer. Hey, you want to make our day? Well, go ahead and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and we'll be jumping for joy. Plus, you guys, your feedback helps us make the show even better for you. Just go to moneypit.com slash review. All right, now we've got Lynn in Delaware on the line who's got a leak in the basement that's as if somebody's turned a faucet on. What's going on? Well, uh, last Thursday we had a torrential rain in Delaware, and um, I was so afraid of trees falling in the rain, I ran down to my basement immediately and about maybe uh, two minutes being down there i hear some sound like somebody turned on a faucet so okay. i look behind the um where the faucet is it comes from the inside the water pipe comes from the outside onto the inside um water was just gushing it was just gushing in just like a faucet so it was coming around the pipe where the pipe comes through the wall yes yes okay Yep. All right. So that makes sense. Uh, You know, what happens is when you get a torrential rain like that, it's going to find the path of the easiest path in the path of least resistance and the holes that are drilled through foundation walls for things like plumbing, like the hose bib in your case, are going to provide an easy entry. So what I would tell you is, is a couple of things. Now, it probably only happens when you get maybe a severe downpour like this and maybe even one that's fueled by rain. But I would, number one, is I would take 
thick silicone, and you can buy a tube of silicone and a little and can squeeze tube, or you can buy one and just to put into a caulking gun. And I would seal the gap around where the pipe comes through the foundation wall. All right, so next I want you to do the same thing on the inside. This is going to stop uh, what happened to you most recently. But the other thing I want you to do is to take a look, if you can, at the drainage conditions outside that wall because you might find that maybe you have an overflowing gutter there or that you have soil that is sort of settling down and maybe it's moving too much water towards that area of the wall. I don't know how high up this, this hose bib is. But generally the roof and surface drainage conditions are what starts this all. And it's an easy fix. You just got to figure out what it is. Um, downspouts are also really important to check. They Most of the time when the gutter companies put them in, they drop them pretty close to the foundation, but we always like to see them extended out four or five feet. So you're moving all that water out away from that wall, and if you can kind of move it out and keep it away, you're going to find that the whole space is a lot drier. And in your particular case, with this little gusher that happened, sealing the area around the pipe should stop that from happening the next time. Oh, okay. Now, another thing that I'm wondering now that you said about the ground settling and everything, this particular stepway, I've had um, gophers, not gophers, what are them things, groundhogs? Groundhogs, yeah. Dig under there, and I'm wondering uh-huh. if they could have messed moved the dirt and made a path or something to this particular... Yeah, they may have. They may have. Generally, the first four to six feet, you want to do what you can to keep the soil sloping away from the walls in those first few feet. So if it does settle in, you just add clean fill dirt, not topsoil, but just fill dirt, very inexpensive, and you pack it in there and you slope it away. Then you could put some mulch or you could put some topsoil and grass over that, but you want to have that soil sloping away, and then it's going to settle every once in a while, and especially if you get any overflowing gutters, it'll just erode and wash away. So that yeah. maintaining that, that sort of slope and that space to keep the walls as dry as possible is important, and it really does uh, help solve a lot of problems with water in the basement and even dampness in the basement. Okay. I appreciate okay. that. That's what I will do then. Thank you so much for taking my call. You're very welcome. Good luck with that project. Thanks for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, if you're in the market for some new furniture, but you don't have a big budget to buy it, well, maybe upcycling could be an awesome solution for you. First of all, some basics here. Upcycling is essentially a term that's the opposite of downcycling, which is what happens when you just throw something away. Now, in between upcycling and downcycling is recycling, which still puts waste back into the environment, but it does so in a more responsible way. Now, we love upcycling because it provides an opportunity to find useful furniture and other household items, and using a bit of your creativity and a small budget for some supplies You can give that piece a second life in your home or your apartment or as a gift for the upcoming holiday season. There's a lot of great ways that you can upcycle. And it's super popular right now. In fact, there's even a fun and very useful Instagram page called Stooping in NYC, where people that spot items being thrown out with the trash take a picture, upload it to the site with its location. If someone thinks the pick looks good, they can head on over to the location and hopefully be the first one to score a great upcycled find. Now, outside of urban areas, many towns and cities have a bulk trash collection day, which is code for free staff. I know that we just had it in our community, Leslie, and we uh, were emptying out um, our nearby house uh, for a neighbor. And we had the entire sort of width of the house on the street sidewalk filled up with stuff. By the next morning when the trucks came, half that stuff was already gone because folks found it useful and decided to upcycle it. So there's a lot of ways to participate in upcycling in terms of doing the project and cleaning out your own house at the same time. Now, when you're shopping for a piece to upcycle, here's a few things that you want to keep in mind. First of all, you want to look at the bones, like how is this piece of furniture built? You want to make sure it's structurally sound. It's not going to need any major repairs so that you can use it. And then look at what cosmetic updates are there. Like, does it need to be cleaned? Can it just be painted? These are all super easy DIY projects. But if it needs a bigger repair, it just might not be worth it. Now, you also want to avoid upholstery and bedding. And here's why, because obviously there's no telling where that furniture has been. If you're talking about a couch or a bedding or an easy chair, you could also have something living inside of it like bed bugs. Now, the exception, yeah, pretty gross, the exception could be a wood chair that's got an upholstered seat, which would be easy to remove and completely replace. Otherwise, it's just not worth working with the upholstered stuff. And you know what, guys? Upcycling is a fun and meaningful way that you can take an item on its way to the trash heap, and then with just a little sweat equity, you can totally make it your own. And those are always the pieces that stand out. So definitely keep this in mind. Now, Leslie, whenever we talk about upcycling, I remember my IKEA couch that you upcycled by reupholstering it and pretty much doubled the life of that oh, sofa yeah. bed. You know, it, it really is a fantastic project. So if there's an opportunity, I went against my own advice about you don't know where it's been. Well, on that piece of upholstery, I knew exactly where it's been. 
<laughs> and so I was happy because it was all our grime and, and whatever was on it. But still, uh, you know, if you find some wood furniture, if you find some tables, some chairs, refinishing tables and chairs is a really easy project. I've done a yeah. couple of those over the last couple of years. Uh, there's always great opportunities. And, you know, one person's trash is another person's treasure. For sure. And you know what? Upholstery definitely is a tricky project to sort of tackle, especially if you don't have experience with it. But you're right. Start with the seat cushion. That's very straightforward. Start with a chair that maybe has some exposed wood so you get a sense of how things work. You always learn best when you start to take things apart. So if you find something that doesn't really matter if you mess it up, try to reupholster it. Take it apart section by section and put it back section by section. This way you know how to do it. That's how I learned. Heading over to Alabama, where we've got Linda on the line. How can we help you today? A couple of years ago, we stained our porch with some, uh, well, it was a dark stain. We had etched it before, and then we put a polyurethane on top. Uh, now, part of this porch is uh, not under cover, but the majority of it is. Well, the, the stuff is peeling off, looks terrible. So what we want to do is uh, get this mess off and maybe use some cement paint, just paint it with cement paint. So I've got some other suggestions for you that would be much more attractive than paint. There's a manufacturer that makes products for covering concrete oh, okay. that look like stone because they actually have stone built into them, and they're absolutely built uh, beautiful. They have a terrazzo version of it. They have a product called Roller Rock. They have a product called Spread Rock. I would take a look at Dyche coatings.com. It's D-A-I-C-H-C-O-A-T-I-N-G-S, dicecoatings.com. These products work really, really well. We're getting great feedback on them, especially this terrazzo product, which is just gorgeous. You could apply this terrazzo product literally in an afternoon and be ready to walk on it the next day. And it's going to look a heck of a lot better than paint. And it really stands up. Okay, uh, now what do you do to prepare for that? There's going to be instructions with all of these products, but basically you have to get o get off the loose paint that's there, whatever the material is you put before. You know, if it's if it's binding, if it's stuck in there and not coming off, then it's fine. But if it's loose and flaky, all the loose stuff has to come off. And there's also some products that they offer that you can use to clean those surfaces and etch them surfaces uh, before you actually uh, apply the products. But follow the instructions. Again, go to dicecoatings.com. Check them out. We've worked with these guys for many years. They're really, really good at this stuff. And I think you'll be surprised with all the options you have. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Streaming October 6th on Paramount+. Plus. first place I learned about death was a pet cemetery. Dead things buried in that land. But come back. There's something else. Something's wrong with Timmy. He needs time to adjust. That's not Timmy. Something's talking through him. Sometimes dead is better. Pet Cemetery. Bloodlines. Rated R. Streaming only on Paramount+. Plus. Instacart helps you get beer and wine delivered in as fast as an hour. So, whether you need to fill the cooler for tailgate season or fill your glass for Pinot by the fire season, you can save time by getting fall sips delivered in just a few clicks. Visit instacart.com or download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. Must be 21 or over for alcohol delivery where available. Instacart. Add life to cart. Heading to Tulsa, where Case is on the line with a decking question. What's going on at your money pit? Hey, guys. So I'm in the process of tearing out uh, the top boards on my deck. It's some a somewhat new deck, but you can tell that it wasn't treated properly on the top boards, so there's some rotting going on. Okay. The joists underneath look pretty good. So I've successfully torn them out and replaced them with new top boards. What I want to know is what does the process look like for sealing that properly to make sure the boards um, don't rot out like they did last time? So is the deck made of pressure-treated lumber, Casey? Yes. The floor joists, are they pressure-treated? Yes. All right. So with pressure treatment, you don't have to worry about decay. Decay should not happen with pressure-treated lumber for a long, long time. What you do have to be concerned about is just the cracking or checking, as we call it when it comes to wood, that happens from exposure to the sun. The UV radiation causes the wood to shrink and crack. So generally, when you're finishing a deck, that's the reason you're finishing it, is to give it some protection against the sun. 
So now that you have uh, taken off the damaged boards, you've got new decking on there. Uh, you might at this point, since we're in fall, want to wait a little bit of time. Uh, I would say this would be a great spring, early summer project because you don't really have to do anything to that for you know a good part of the first year. But since we're going into uh, the fall now, I'd make this maybe a spring summer project to do. You want to make sure you you find a period of time when the the deck is really dry. A couple of days of sun would be great, and then you're going to use a good quality stain on that an exterior stain. You have some options on how dense that stain is. It comes transparent, semi-transparent, and then solid color. Now, we always recommend solid color, and the reason is because it gives the deck the most protection, yet you can still see the grain through it. Most popular is semi-transparent, but it won't last nearly as long. Uh, when you apply it, you can apply it with a roller. You can apply it with a spray. It's a little bit tricky to get into the nooks and crannies when it comes with a deck, so I kind of like a spray application, and you could rent a sprayer. You could buy um, a sprayer. They're not very expensive. They're made by a lot of great companies. Wagner makes one just for homeowners. And I tell you, my buddy did his deck and a gazebo with uh, with a sprayer, and he was using paint, not even stain, because he just wanted to paint it. And the whole project took him like a day because it was just so efficient to, to apply the product that way. So that's what you're up against. Uh, just uh, wait to spring, early summer, and stain it, and you should get maybe four, five, six years out of it that way. Great. Thank you so much. I love the show and uh, appreciate the help. You got it. Good luck with that project, Casey. Well, if you guys have been thinking about replacing all the bulbs you have left in your house, it might have been incandescents or CFLs to LEDs, but maybe not sure about the cost savings. We have found that upgrading to LED bulbs really is a great way to save money. And that's because LED bulbs use a lot less energy and can last for decades. Yeah. Now, maybe you find yourself being a little put off by the price of LEDs. I mean, I know I was when they first came out because they definitely are pricey. But the cost now has come way down, especially in this past year. And you don't need to buy a ton of bulbs to start seeing that savings. Now, to get started, you can replace bulbs in the lights that you use most often or the ones that stay on the most. Replacing these first will have the biggest immediate impact on your energy savings. And from there, you can replace the older bulbs with LEDs on fixtures that have multiple bulbs. Yeah, and finally, you want to make sure that you're getting the best results for your new LED bulbs. You want to make sure that they're rated for that specific use or fixture. And, you know, example here, if you've got a lamp or a light with a dimmer, you want to make sure it's a type that works with LED bulbs. Like, you got to make sure things kind of go hand in hand because if you try to use an LED bulb that's not rated for dimming, it's not going to work on a switch that's dimmable. I learned this the hard way, but, you know, I had other lamps I could put that bulb in. So we were good. Yeah, and here's another thing to keep in mind. If you're going to replace a fixture, like I just bought new lights for the outside of my front door, like some sort of pretty sconce lights, well, the LEDs are actually built into those lamps now. So there's no bulb to add. It's actually part of the light itself, so you don't even have to shop for a bulb. So you can find those as well if you're buying new fixtures. All in all, they really provide a great quality of light, and they last a long, long time. Or Linda in Nevada, you've got the money pit. What can we do for you today? I bought a house in Nevada in Henderson, and uh, slowly but surely I have been plugging up all the areas for draft that's coming in. And then I realized, because I have a sofa in front of this fireplace, so a uh, gas fireplace, there is a huge draft coming out that was just hitting my ankle. So I would like to know what is it that I can do to, to cover that draft? Do I have to cover up the whole fireplace? Is there, you know, I, I have no idea what to do. Yeah. Well, you've got to have a damper. <laughs> so the, there's lots of different types of dampers. There's You probably have a damper already. There could be a, a mechanical damper right above the firebox. There could be a flue damper up towards the top of the flue. Or you could just put glass doors on the fireplace. That's another way to kind of slow yeah, down the drafts. Yeah, but even with the glass doors, if that flue is open, you can still feel a little bit of a draft. Because we have right. that. And I notice that if I forget to close the flue, then I'm like, oh, it's time to close it. I will look to see about the damper, see if there's anything I can close. But if I close that damper and I still have a draft and I do need to put a glass there, a glass cover, where do you find a glass cover? I well, glass doors, no, glass doors, glass fireplace doors are widely available pretty much everywhere. So. I mean, we had ours done from like the local hearth place. I believe it was called like Hearth and Leisure. There's probably somebody right in your areas, you know, right near Henderson. I know that area of Vegas and... 
in Nevada. And that's a good spot. You probably have somebody there already that can do this for you. And there's so many choices and so many finishes and different designs on the glass and different framework and, you know, all different price ranges as well. So don't be surprised when some are really expensive. Um, but it's beautiful. And it also, when you're running your gas fireplace, you can keep those closed. And it really does generate quite a lot of heat. It does. I just didn't think that they would. I mean, I have it blocked with my sofa. I don't really use a fireplace at all. Oh, my gosh. But, gas uh, fireplaces are so cozy. Uh, well, the real one. See, I'm used to the real thing. <laughs> no, I, I hear difference. you. I'm all for a wood-burning fireplace. But our neighbors have a gas fireplace. And anytime we go visit them, it just it gets downright warm. In fact, hot in their living room. It's lovely. Okay. I will try it. All right. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. John, you've got the Money Pit. How can we help you today? I have the rain spot in my house in two different areas that when it rains, the water goes behind the rain spout against the soft or the fascia against the house and comes in between the rain spout and the house. Huh. Some a lot of the water does go down the rain spot, but some goes behind the rain spot, and um, I'm afraid it may drip onto the wood and start rotting the wood. And I don't know how I can fix that from occurring. So it sounds to me like the gutter is becoming over overflowed, is overwhelmed, and so the water's backing up over the back edge of the of the trough of the gutter. Um, I don't think that's the case. It's not overflowing, but somehow the water is being carried away, but yet there's still some water making it, to your point, behind the rain spot towards the house. And I know it's not an overflow situation. Okay. And I had a new roof put on about two years ago. So, All right, so typically when, when gutters are installed by roofers, uh, the downspout is a three-inch downspout or a four-inch downspout. And it's pierced through the gutter body down into it. And the, the hole that is actually created there is a fairly small opening. What we usually recommend is to use an, a larger downspout, one that's a six inch downspout because it has less restrictions. And this way okay. more water can fall into it. I suspect, however, that the joint between the downspout and the gutter was made. It's allowing for this to occur. So, you know, the simple thing to do is to get a ladder and get up there and take a good hard look at it, grab a hose, Run some water down the roof. Watch if you can see exactly what's happening in that space and what's letting the water get get behind it. But I suspect that that the connection between the downspout and the gutter is not done correctly. You could try to fix that, and you could try to seal it. You know, maybe you have to mechanically take it apart and you know bend or rivet or something in to get it where it needs to be, and then seal the whole thing with silicone caulk. Uh, or if that doesn't work, you might want to try to switch it out to a larger downspout. And that will have less tendency to, to hold any of the water back and it will, you know, gravity will take over and that'll be that. That, that sounds like a solution to me. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That sounds like a, a good idea. Let's get this, some silicone in there too. Okay. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. The is it morning yet deal? How about now or now? Because morning time is McDonald's breakfast time. And that's the best time of all the times. Get any sized iced coffee for just 99 cents until 11 a.m. And sweeten the deal when you pair it with a baked apple or pumpkin and creme pie. After all, why wait to treat yourself? Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Well, as some may know, carbon monoxide, or CO as it's often referred to, is an odorless gas that results from the combustion of fuel. So we're talking about natural gas, oil, kerosene, even charcoal, and it can make you sick or it can cause death. And in the years that I spent inspecting homes before getting out of the crawl space and into the radio studio, I found carbon monoxide leaks with shocking frequency. Yeah, and that's why you absolutely must have your heating system tuned up every year. Now, Tom, we always say that, but what exactly is the tech looking for that could lead to these toxic situations? Yeah, good, good question. So the tech, first of all, is going to look at the, the color of the flame for good combustion. So if you have a blue flame, that's what you want. That is a properly adjusted flame. But if you see an orange flame, that is a dirty flame. That means you have very incomplete combustion, and that can actually contain a lot of carbon monoxide. And also, you want to make sure you don't have any kind of sweet, like an acid-type odor that comes out of that because, again, signs of carbon monoxide. 
And finally, you want to look at the heat exchanger. This is sort of the internal guts of the furnace. And with um, seat of medium to older furnaces, you can see this pretty clearly. With the newer ones, it's getting a little bit harder. But this is what keeps the combustion gas separate from the house air that blows around it to be to be warmed. So they'll inspect that. And also, we want to check the ventilation. We check also for what's called backdraft. So if we have a block chimney, for example, then all of those fumes, which are sort of like warm and moist, are going to come back out of the furnace draft hood. So any of those could be signs of carbon monoxide and need to be picked up. Yeah, but we should also mention other sources of carbon monoxide that can also be hazardous, like never run a car, use a barbecue, or run a generator, or even a lawnmower in a garage, even an open garage, because those fumes are going to rise, they're going to start to fill the house, and it's going to sneak up on you, and before you know it, you're sleeping. So it's, you know, you got to be careful. Absolutely. So important. Great point. And even if everything's operating properly, it is always important to also have carbon monoxide detectors. In fact, Those carbon monoxide detectors are not just a good idea. They're, in fact, mandatory in many jurisdictions. So you want to make sure you have at least one on every floor of your house, including detectors outside every bedroom. You know why? Because that is where most carbon monoxide poisonings occur while you're sleeping. So many times you just don't wake up. So you want to make sure you have detectors outside of your bedroom. Well, Stacy reached out to Team Money Pit and says, I've been told by roofing contractors that spray foam insulation on the bottom side of the roof can void a shingle warranty. I recently heard you recommending doing the foam for insulation, which is correct. So that's a great question, Stacy, and I guess the answer is it depends. Now, some roofing shingle manufacturers Um, have tried to avoid warranties or have voided warranties because they feel like the spray foam raises the temperature on the roof shingle itself. I got to tell you, though, I am not impressed with roofing manufacturer warranties, roof shingle warranties, and here's why. Because they only offer, at best, a depreciated value based on the age of the roof. And it's only going to be on materials. They don't cover labor. So if you can imagine, the cost of a roof replacement has got to be at least 75 or 80% labor and maybe 20% materials. So if that roof is 10 years old, that means they're going to give you at half the cost of new shingles, but all the expense of tearing off the old and adding the new is on you, even in a normal circumstance with a valid warranty claim. It's just not worth that much. On the flip side, Having spray foam insulation, as I have personally added to the underside of my roof to tell you how much I'm worried about this when we put on a new roof, it's underside in the attic space. It's not the gable walls. Um, the, that roof space is completely sealed in right now, and i got to tell you, I could not be happier. My energy bills have not been lower. I no longer have a huge difference in temperature between the rest of the house and the attic. It just doesn't get that cold up there, uh, and it's a much more stable environment for all the stuff that we store as well. So I'm not terribly worried about voiding warranties, and that's why. But I do agree that some manufacturers are trying to make that point. I just don't see it. All right. Now we've got a question here from Jamie who says, my aunt has a one-story, 2,400-square-foot, 1963 home on a full basement. Winter temps can be in the 20s and 30s, and summer's in the 90s. There's heat in the ceilings, but it doesn't work in a couple of rooms. She wants to upgrade the heating system, but the electric company told her a heat pump system might not be the best choice because it gets too cold and will switch to backup heat and super high, high bills. What's the best heating and cooling system for the house? So it is good advice from the electric company. What's going to happen with a traditional um, air-to-air heat pump is this. You're going to have um, the heat pump, which is what a heat pump is, is kind of like if you've ever had a a window air conditioner, you know, that that blows cold air into the house and warm air outside. Well, if you flip that around, stuck it in the winter, that's kind of like a heat pump. It's sort of the reverse of the cooling cycle, but it blows that warm air throughout the house. The problem is that it can only maintain about two degrees difference between what the temperature is in the room and what you set it at. And if it goes more than that because it's cold. What it's going to do is bring up an electric, straight electric resistance backup heat system, which is going to run about two or two and a half times more to operate than the heat pump itself. So that's why it's really designed for moderate temperatures. Secondly, the ceiling is never a good place for heat distribution. So I would be looking for options to have a system that's fueled by gas, by propane, or by oil. Those are going to be the least expensive ways to go. All right, Jamie, good luck with that. Definitely something to keep in mind. We do have such crazy temperature swings in the Northeast, just like that. 20s, 90s. (laughs) Can't find a right zone. 
This is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show on air and online at moneypit.com. We hope you're enjoying a beautiful fall weekend taking on projects around your house. If you run into a problem, an issue, got a question, don't know where to start, or you're stuck in the middle, remember you can reach out to us 24-7 by calling 1-888-MONEYPIT. That's 888-666-3974. Or better yet, for the fastest possible response, just go to moneypit.com slash ask and click the blue microphone button. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. Remember, you can do it yourself. But you don't have to do it alone. 